This will be lab six. Uh, it's two fairly simple labs that could be a lot more complex. Uh, the first lab is the DNA extraction part of the from the supplement, and we'll look at those instructions. Uh, you might have done this before. It's a pretty popular lab. I know they use it in some of the chem courses. Some of the biology courses do a similar thing, and a lot of high schools do it because it's a simple lab and it always works. Um, and then we're also going to look at what's called RFLP analysis using electrophoresis. So let's kind of take a look at them. So here are the, the protocols for the strawberry DNA extraction. Uh, we'll post a video uh, on how to do it if you want to try it at home. Uh, pretty simple. Uh, all you need is a strawberry. It could be fresh or frozen. Uh, you need to make an extraction buffer, which really is just dish soap and, and um, water and salt. Uh, it's nice if you have a cheesecloth or some sort of thing to strain it with. Uh, coffee filter, uh, even um, a sieve or colander would work okay. Um, and you need some ice cold alcohol. Uh, ethanol works. You could even use uh, uh, alcohol uh, that people would drink if you wanted to, although many people probably wouldn't want to waste that. So um, what you do is you get a fresh strawberry, you remove the sepals, that's the green stuff on the top. Uh, you mash up the berry. It's usually easiest just to put it in a plastic bag. And you squish it as much as you can. And let's kind of relate it to something we looked at at a lecture. Uh, when we digest things, right? Remember, digestion was breaking things into small enough units for absorption. We do it two ways. We do it uh, chemically as well as mechanically. So your idea here is to mechanically mash the strawberry as much as possible. Because we want to extract the DNA. And uh, DNA in a strawberry is similar to DNA in us in many ways. Um, it's inside the nucleus, which is inside the cell. And so we have to mash up the strawberry and get through these multiple layers and break up in the plant cells, the cell wall, in order to get the DNA and liberate it into the solution. So you want to mash it up for like two minutes. You just want this nice, fine pulp. Then you're going to take that extraction buffer. You would pour it in to the mixed strawberry. You'd reseal the bag and you'd mash it more with the extraction buffer. And then the extraction buffer works to chemically digest this. So we did mechanical with our fingertips and just squish in the bag. And then once we extract the once we put in the extraction buffer, we're now chemically breaking this down as well. Then you're going to filter it through cheesecloth. And what's going to happen is you're going to get a strawberry mixture that's got the DNA in it into some sort of container all right and usually at this point in time you end up with a couple mils about two mils is usually what most people get maybe three or four um, that end up you know actually making it through the the cheesecloth that end, ends up getting filtered through and then what you're going to do is you're going to take ice cold ethanol and slowly drop in the ethanol into the tube and what happens when you do this is where the interface between the strawberry extraction uh, things you took and the ethanol, uh, the DNA isn't soluble in ethanol. So where it meets, the DNA actually, actually precipitates out. And it literally looks like snot. It looks like somebody blew their nose on it. Um, and you kind of see it right here in this picture where, you know, she's got this you know stick here's the strawberry juice here's the alcohol and you can kind of see it right there right if you follow it up there's the precipitated out dna that she's winding around this wooden peg thing so uh it's pretty simple to do and um it just kind of shows that there's dna uh, inside strawberries as, as well as us all right, so this is the instructions that I just talked about and kind of shows mash up the strawberries, right? Um, filter it, put it in a tube, mix in uh, the ice cold ethanol, and then you see the fuzzy stuff here. That's the DNA.
So it's pretty easy to do, and we'll talk about what you're responsible for in, in a few minutes. Um, the second part is what's called RFLP analysis. RFLP stands for Restriction Fragment Length Polymorphism, and it's a way to try to identify unknown DNA. And in many ways, it's similar to what we did in Lab 4 with the thin layer chromatography, where we tried to identify unknowns based on RF. And in thin layer chromatography for Lab 4, as a review, we separated uh, amino acids in a solvent on a silica gel plate based on its solubility and size. What we're going to do with the electrophoresis is we're going to separate DNA in a gel with electricity. And basically, the basic context is we are going to fill up the DNA in these wells. We're going to send an electrical current across the gel. The gel sits in a buffered solution of uh, you know, mostly distilled water. It's buffered to prevent pH changes. And as we send the electrical signal across this gel, uh, if you remember DNA, it is a nucleotide. And again, great example of how we just build on things in this class. The nucleotides make up nucleic acids. And all in a DNA, there's four different nucleotides, right? The C, T, right? A and G. Um, so there's these uh, different nucleotides. Now, all nucleotides have a couple things in common, okay? They always have that nitrogen base, which tells us whether it's the C, T, A, or G. They always have a sugar. In the case of DNA, it's always deoxyribose. That's where the D comes from, from DNA. And they always have a Phosphate and phosphate we've mentioned before, especially when we talked about the functional groups building on class material again, that phosphates have a big negative two charge typically. So as we put the DNA into these wells and send the electricity across it, the DNA molecules are electrically charged and they have a negative charge. So what happens is the positive pole is down at this end and the DNA is dragged through the gel to the positive end. Okay. Now, because the DNA is in different sized fragments, the smaller fragments are going to move faster, and the uh, larger fragments are going to move slower. So we can separate DNA based on their size uh, in this experiment. All right, so basically what we would do is we would split the table up. Some people would do the extraction buffer, um, strawberry, alcohol thing, and other group would uh, do the loading the gel and then sending it through the electrophoresis process for that. All right. And really, I, I'm not going to worry about Fox, but we're going to worry about uh, a, a couple uh, simple questions. And Looking at the lab supplement, here are the questions. And so I'm going to uh, go away from that in a second, but I want to show you something else. So this is what the gel looks like after the experiment. So we loaded the DNA samples here. And these DNA samples had been cut by a what's called a restriction enzyme. That's where the R FLP comes from restriction fragment. And the idea is that uh, if you had the same DNA, it would match perfectly. If you had different DNA, it could match perfectly or it could be completely different. And so the idea was to cut the DNA with different sized fragments. Uh, in different size fragments using what they call restriction enzymes. These are enzymes that we have isolated from viruses and other microorganisms where their job basically is to snip DNA from their host and insert their DNA into that spot. And so they have these enzymes that snip up DNA. So what you do is you take DNA, 
You expose it to that enzyme and it cuts it up. So we simplify this experiment a little bit so we can easily understand it. But if you'll notice, we have two bands here, right? So this is column A, look at the top, column A, and we have two bands, okay? And just like we saw with the uh, RF values, right? Uh, we had the negative pole here and the DNA, sorry, the positive pole at the bottom, and the DNA being negatively charged migrated down. The smaller fragments moved faster than the larger fragments. As a matter of fact, you can course sort of tell that they're smaller and larger fragments. So if you look at this one right here at the bottom, it's the lightest. And it's the lightest because it didn't pick up uh, as much of the uh, chemical that makes it shine because it's smaller. And these shine a little more because they're the medium-sized fragments. And these shine the most because they're the largest fragments. So the smallest fragments move quicker. So the idea would be if we had the exact same DNA molecule and chopped it up the exact same way, then we would have the exact same pattern. All right. So that's what we're looking at with this uh, analysis for that. The problem is we get a lot of potential patterns that are the same, but they're not the same DNA. Right. And it's sort of like this. If I said, okay, go to the library and pick me up a book. And I don't remember what the name of the book was. But I do know that the first word is the. And you would go, okay, but there's thousands of books in the library that are the. I can open a book and it would say it or of or on or something like that. I know that's not your book. But just because it says the, it may not be your book. And so you can have uh, DNA that looks the same in its banding pattern that's completely different. But if you really had my book, then you know the first word was the. And as I start to think of more and more words, right, um, let's say the second word is night. So when you pick up a book and it says the night, yeah, there's probably hundreds of books that actually have the word the night as the first, or the, I guess the phrase, the night, in the first two words. But if it says, you know, the pizza, the monster, whatever it was, right, then you can say, oh, the second word doesn't match. It's not your DNA. And so how many words would you have to match before you said, oh, yeah, this is the book James wants, okay? And so the more words that match, the better. And so the more banding patterns that match, the better, okay? So what we did in this experiment is and let me show you so we took a couple different restriction enzymes and we used a c and e so i circled them these are all the exact uh same restriction enzyme that we used but with three different dna samples all right and let's say a was the known and c and E were the unknowns. Okay, so which one matches the A? That's what we're looking for. So if we look at this pattern, we'll say, okay, we got one here, we got here, this is A. We go to C, and we go, oh look, we got one here and one here. Oh, it's the same. But as I just talked about a minute ago, you can't say it's the same DNA. You can say it's consistent with the idea, but just matching once doesn't show it's the same DNA. Just like finding the word the for my book doesn't mean it's actually the book. And interestingly, uh, in E, the other person also matches exactly. So look at the banding pattern. It's exactly the same, okay? which tells us that it's consistent that both C and E could be A, right? could be a match for A. So cutting it up one way doesn't really do any good. So we're going to cut it up a different way. So I'm going to go ahead and say, okay, we're going to look at B, D, and F. And that's the same restriction enzyme that cuts the DNA up into different strips at the exact same place every time. And for that, right, we're just going to compare these. So if I look at B, right, I say, oh, look, I got this banding pattern. 
I look at D and I say, oh, wait, this one's different, right? This is right here and it should be right there and it's higher. And this one's right here and it should be right here. There's one higher and as a matter of fact, it's got an extra band. So there's no way that B and D could be the same DNA, which means they don't match, right? Which means it's not our unknown. But if we look at F, it matches perfectly. So it's consistent with the idea that B and F were the same person because the DNA matches. Again, you may not have sufficient number, number of matches to be sure. And when you get more and more matches, it becomes uh, more and more sure that that's the DNA sample is the same. All right. Um, we don't use this technique anymore, just like many of the techniques we use in the, library, it's to de in the laboratory. It's to demonstrate things, but it doesn't necessarily show what is actually happening in modern science. And we actually can do DNA sequencing and things like that, where we can be more sure. And that's what if you watch some of those daytime shows when they say, oh, we're 99.8% sure you're the father, right, from that DNA test. Uh, they have much better ways to tell. Okay? So we'll look at these questions in, in a minute as well. But that's kind of the idea of what you're supposed to be doing for the electrophoresis. So, you know, this is just going to kind of go through a little bit more about how we get there. So... We're not going to worry too much about the uh, polymorphisms or um, your uh, copy number variations. Um, we're, let's not worry about that. Uh, let's little, little worry about worry a little bit about the restriction enzymes. So again, restriction enzymes are enzymes we've isolated from typically microorganisms that cut DNA at very specific sequences, and I kind of mention that you're not going to have to worry about where it cuts at the three prime and five prime end and, and things like that. But basically restriction enzymes always cut at very specific sequences. All right. So as an example, this restriction enzyme in this uh, example cuts where there's a G and then followed by an AATTC. So if it came across and it was a G and an AAC, it wouldn't cut it because it has to match exactly. And then if it was a microorganism, then it would insert its DNA into the gap and then now have a new recombined DNA molecule. That's called recombinant DNA. You've probably heard that term, and that's basically what we do. So we snip a, a DNA, shove some sort of DNA inside, and now we've got a new DNA molecule. So pretty simple. Uh, I don't have to worry about those either. Basically, uh, what this is showing is if you do the RFLP analysis for uh, someone with the normal allele for hemoglobin in the sickle cell uh, gene for hemoglobin, you're going to get different matching uh, patterns. Uh, because of where there, a certain restriction enzyme would, would cut them in. So, again, large fragments at the top, smaller fragments at the bottom, right? So what the BP stands for in this is 175 base pairs, right? So this says 175 base pairs, so it's got, you know, basically it's like a train with 175 uh, cars. This one is a train with like 201 cars. This is a train with 376 cars, and these would be, you know, trains with, you know, potentially thousands of cars at this end. So, you know, the idea is that if you cut different DNA up with the right restriction enzyme, you'll get a different banding pattern. If you cut the same DNA up with the restriction enzyme, it should look exactly the same every time. So here's an example of, uh, you know, some of the different ways to, to do the RFLP analysis. Um, and, uh, you know, this one's looking at DNA matches and, you know, here's the DNA from the victim and here's the DNA, right, from uh, 
the evidence collected at the scene and then here's the DNA from the different suspects and if you look right you see this DNA in suspect one matches our evidence here so this is consistent with the idea that suspect one did it suspect two right they don't match so they did not leave any of their DNA at the crime scene it could be that they just didn't and or we didn't find it or more likely they weren't there at all but that's kind of how it works um, you know the uh, advent of this back in especially in the late 90s and early 2000s when this was you know the, the best test we had um, they went back and looked at different evidence from crime scenes and um, you know this guy here was uh, you know wrongly put in prison uh, for uh, a crime they did the DNA evidence after he'd been in prison for 17 years and found that you know uh, his name was Earl Washington that uh, his DNA did not match the DNA on the victim and actually it was someone else who uh, did it and then um, you know eventually the guy that did it for real uh, pleaded guilty to it so you know this has helped but traditionally it's used to to get people um, off of crimes make them innocent because it's easy to say, which makes sense scientifically, oh look, this DNA did match. Here's the, here's the DNA from the victim. Here's the DNA from the person on trial. It doesn't match. He didn't do it, right? Really simple. But trying to convince a jury that says, oh look, this DNA and this DNA matches. This DNA and this DNA matches. This DNA and this DNA matches. But how many times do you have to convince a jury that that has to match for them to send somebody to life in prison, for instance, or 20 years in prison? And so DNA evidence has been tri uh, traditionally the, to use people and let them um, off. So let's look at some uh, more questions from this and see what you really, really have to know for this experiment. Okay, so the DNA thing sort of complex and I think the level of complexity is a little higher than I want you to know and I just don't think that you have the same background generally speaking as a student in this class in DNA than you do a lot of the other things so here's what I've decided you need to know for lab six for lab six you need to know the study question answers for the star you know the strawberry DNA extraction experiment and the gel elect electrophoresis experiment so let's go over them and it's probably not a bad way to kind of look at what you're responsible for so uh, the first question says did you get what appears to be DNA so this is the extraction one please describe the DNA if you didn't get DNA please postulate guess right uh, what potentially happened that where you couldn't get DNA uh, I'll be honest I have never I've done this experiment for probably five or six years which means I have three groups per year, so it's six. So there's been 30 experiments at least that I've done with this, and we've always gotten DNA. All right, so do you think I would ask you a lab question that says, did you get DNA when we may have not even done the lab, right? So that doesn't make sense. And, you know, what does it look like? It looks like mucus, right? It looks literally like somebody blew their nose on the stirring rod. So, yeah, you're responsible for that one, but, you know, you could probably think, okay, James wouldn't ask it. Uh, number two asks about the extraction buffer, and uh, why do we use it? So, if you look at the lab supplement, there is information for the materials used for the strawberry DNA extraction experiment. So, I've sort of summarized it here. In the extraction buffer, it has soap and sodium chloride, salt. All right, so it's water, soap, and literally it's like joy, right? Or, you know, since it's probably from Target, it's probably, you know, whatever their Target, Great Lander, is that what the Target brand is or whatever? Um, so it's just soap and salt. And why do we use soap and salt? Well, the soap helps to dissolve the lipid membranes remember the DNA is within 
the cell membrane, which is within the nucleus of the cell, which is also covered by a nuclear envelope, which is multiple bilayers. So we have to kind of dissolve that lipid membrane to get the DNA out. The salt, the sodium chloride, helps to keep the DNA molecules together. Um, because remember, the salt, when we put it in solution, it dissociates. And that positive uh, cation of the sodium helps to stabilize the negative charges from the phosphate in the DNA. So it stabilizes the molecule. Um, the other thing the salt does is it helps to remove the proteins that are bound to DNA. And so uh, the, by removing the proteins, it helps to keep the, uh, the DNA dissolved in the solution until we're ready to precipitate it out. All right. Um, what's the role of ethanol? Number three. Uh, well, DNA is not very soluble in alcohol. So by mixing with ethanol, then we're ready to precipitate out the DNA so it's the stuff that looks like snot so we can see it. Um, and then the, the number five is what are the advantages of using a strawberry to extract DNA instead of mammalian tissue? Well, I'll, I'll tell you one from my experience. We used to use... Um, thymus from a cow and uh, they're very difficult to get we have to go to specialty butcher we only need a little bit but you know they're not going to sell you just a little bit so we have to buy you know usually like a minimum of a pound and then you know what do you do with uh you know if you, you get a pound of it you get you know 0.987 uh of the thymus for next semester and it doesn't keep very well when you refrigerate it and defrost it you start to lose the yield uh, to do this experiment on uh, thymus you have to keep everything cold and it just doesn't work very well so it's easier to extract dna from plants than animals even though this is a human physiology class and ripe strawberries are excellent sources for dna because they're easy to pulverize they actually have enzymes that you release in them that helps to break down some of the things within the cell, um, especially the cell walls. The other thing is that um, strawberries are octoploids. Um, they only have uh, uh, eight chromosomes, to be honest, um, but they have eight copies of those. So they actually have 64 sets of chromosomes. While humans, we have 23 chromosomes, but we're diploid, which means we only have uh, two copies, one from your mom, one from your dad. So uh, there's certainly plenty of DNA, and it's easier to get at, um, and so it just works better. So that's kind of the, the, the answers for that one. So that's what you have to know literally for the extraction one. And for the electrophoresis one, here's what you should know. Uh, and we'll kind of talk about some of these as we go through them and why maybe a few of them are not as important. So... Uh, what's an RFLP and what's its significance? So an RFLP, again, stands for Restriction Fragment Length Polymorphism. And if you break this word down, it, it makes kind of sense. Restriction refers to restriction enzymes. Those are the enzymes that cut DNA at specific sequences. Fragment is just what you think about it, right? It's a part of something, right? Length, right? Uh, you know, we're, we're looking at the length of how many base pairs there were, right? So, you know, some of them have base pairs that are much smaller and some of them have base pairs that are much longer. And that's going to allow us to separate them differentially in an in a electric field in a gel. And polymorphism, poly means many, morphism is shape, right? So it basically says the restriction enzyme cuts the DNA up into many, many different shapes, okay? And so what RFLP does is it's um, a technique that's used to identify unknown DNA, right? That's probably the easiest way to define it. Number two asks, a little too far, um, what's the steps in DNA fingerprinting from extraction through autoradiography? I want you to know how to do these experiments in general, but let's be honest, you know, we're not doing it in lab. Uh, even if we're in lab, we're not doing it. Um, we're not going to worry about all of the different things that um, 
happen. And in fact, when we do this experiment in lab, we don't do A and B or C for that matter. We actually buy a kit that already has A, B, C done. So we did not start there, right? Um, we do use the ag agarose gel though to separate the fragments by size. Um, and then uh, we actually use a different test to um, determine things. So we don't do E and F or G even. So what we actually do is we just do D in, in class. So there's like nothing to remember, don't worry about two. Um, one of the other things that, that comes up is it seems like all DNA, when it's studied, has these repeated DNA sequences. And there was a time when I was in school, we didn't know what they were for. And then for a while after I finished school, uh, scientists were pretty confident that these DNA sequences were just viral inserts of DNA that just got inserted again and again and again and again and that most of those inserts at back you know some time ago all of those inserts were just you know random viral inserts that didn't mean anything to humans in terms of their uh, information for our genes and now uh, uh, we know that they have a little more function um, in terms of that and that maybe some of them are uh, more for control of DNA expression or replication. And it's not always just viral inserts, but still a large portion of it is viral inserts. Uh, number four is interesting. Who are the only individuals possessing the same DNA fingerprints, right? So when you get that test done that we kind of looked at in the PowerPoint, um, it's called a DNA fingerprint, right? And the idea would be that, you know, your fingerprint only applies to you, right? So somebody's DNA fingerprint would only apply to them. So the only people that would have the same fingerprints, theoretically, are identical twins, right? Now, identical twins means they came from the same fertilized egg that split into, or I guess you have triplets and so on, that split into, you know, multiple individuals. Uh, so uh, you should theoretically have the same DNA, which means your DNA analysis should look the same by the process we just mentioned with electrophoresis. However, with modern technology, there's no evidence that we've ever cloned humans, but it is theoretically possible. Um, so by definition, a clone would also have the same DNA. So if you had an evil clone running around somewhere, then maybe, you know, you'd have a person that had the exact same DNA. The number five is more kind of an anatomy related question. What type of human cells can be utilized for this technique? So you need cells that have DNA, which really mean you need human cells that have a nucleus. And when we look at things a certain way, you go, okay, you know, you got to think about it for a second. So can we get DNA from blood? Yeah, but the plasma is just liquid, so that doesn't have any DNA because it has no cells. And red blood cells, we'll learn later, are mostly a nucleate. It means they don't have a nucleus by the time they mature and get into your bloodstream. So you can get it from blood, DNA, with the white blood cells, because white blood cells do have a nucleus. Semen you can get it from because the head of the sperm has a nucleus. It only has 23 chromosomes instead of 46. You can get it from skin, but you have to go deep in the skin, right? So if you remember from anatomy, remember the skin had multiple layers, right? You know, not just the epidermis and the dermis, but where the epidermis met the dermis, right? You've got that first layer of the epidermis called the stratum basalis, right? Um, where the mitotic divisions take place and that pushes the cells up. And as the uh, epidermal cells get closer and closer to the surface, they eventually lose their nucleus and become keratinized. And now they're basically dead. So you can't get surface cells because they don't have DNA because they don't have a nucleus, but you need deeper cells. And the same thing with the hair, right? If you just came by and chopped somebody's hair, it, it's, it's, 
difficult to get DNA from it, although now they can do some analysis with just that type of hair. But typically, you know, you need uh, the roots, which has the bulb, which has the place where mitosis is happening, which has the DNA. So anything that's got uh, a nucleus, in humans at least, uh, you can use for uh, DNA analysis. So those are the questions you have to worry about uh, for this. And really, it's this page that you really, really have to study and, and understand. And if you understand and study this page, then you should do okay on this portion of the exam. So you can probably guess, since it's not very extensive, the amount of information from lab six will be less than the other labs on the exam.